as I said in my introduction, we are going to, we are going to hear from three different projects that have been realized through the QV Pullion, the Artistic Research Funding Program, uh, and there will be. Um, um, a moderator for the session who is right behind me, Rune Sösting, who will introduce more in full. But let me introduce Rune. So he's a composer and, and artist who has an MA in modern culture um, and uh, cultural communication uh, from the University of Copenhagen and a PhD from the Academy of Fine Arts and the University of Copenhagen together. Um, that uh, you graduated with, I think, five years ago. Um, and in your work, you're particularly concerned with the role that kind of the circumstance or the circumstantial play in the meaning or the formation of kind of or aesthetic meaning formation, as well as kind of social and political consequences thereof. Um, uh, of course, uh, I know and perhaps others here know you from kind of the sound art context also. You uh, have your own practice in that, but also curated and organized events like Nordic Sound Art, which actually was a study program, an MA study program across the Nordic Art Academies on sound-based uh, art practice. And you're actually a frequent teacher at the different art schools that the center engages with. I won't name them all, but um, uh, well, the Rhythmic Music Conservatory, uh, among others. So please uh, welcome Rune that welcomes the rest of the speakers. Yes, I'm, I'm uh, really delighted to be the moderator of this, uh, uh, this uh, salon. Uh, we have three different uh, presentations. Uh, it's from uh, artists who come from very different fields and from different uh, uh, institutional uh, contexts. I'll briefly uh, introduce uh, the three uh, uh, presenters here. Uh, then, uh, in turn, they will come and, and give a 20-minute presentation of their projects. Then afterwards, we will uh, move to the salon, where we will have a, where there'll be a time for a, a discussion and, uh, and questions from the audience. So, the program for this uh, salon is better. Um, uh, the first uh, presenter here is uh, Emil Krustein. Uh, he's an award-winning uh, pianist and a graduate of the Royal Danish Music Conservatory and the Sibelius Academy in Helsinki, with further studies at the Como International Piano Academy in Italy. He's been rewarded, rewarded uh, numerous uh, national and international uh, piano competitions, and he received awards, uh, um, among others, uh, the Danish uh, Sonning Award in 2007 and the Pro Music Award of Finland in 2011. Uh, Emil Krustin is a member of the teaching facility at Aalborg School of Arts and at the Royal Danish Academy of Music in Copenhagen. He will be uh, presenting considerations based on his artistic research project, uh, Beethoven Reconstructed, that he is developing at the Royal Danish Music Conservatory. In his uh, artistic research project, uh, he explores how analysis and theory developed by the Austrian music theorist Heinrich Schenker can contribute to an innovative interpretation and performance of the late piano sonatas by Ludwig van Beethoven. Uh, this work allows for uh, reconsideration of the role of the performing musician's traditional role as an interpreter. It uh, further opens for consideration of a new type of uh, performer-actor, and questions regarding this, uh, uh, am among others, uh, the ethical perspectives. And these are the perspectives that Emil uh, will, uh, probably among other things, will um, uh, present uh, to us today. Following uh, Emil's uh, uh, presentation, we will have a presentation by Andreas uh, Liebmann, who is a Swiss uh, performance artist uh, based in Copenhagen. Uh, Andreas Liebmann studied at the Acting Academy in Zurich from uh, 1993 to 1997. Uh, he has been teaching at the Universities of the Arts in Zurich, Berlin and Leipzig. Since 2015, he is teaching at the Danish National School of Performing Arts in the area of idea-based and conceptual direction. He co-founded uh, the performance group uh, uh, Gaststube uh, that developed experimental performances and created theatre pieces, durational performances, installations, bus tours, walks and other formats. Since this group is split up, Andreas Liebmann has been developing his own formats and working methods as a stage director, performer and author. In his presentation today, Andreas Liebmann will report from his artistic research project, Imaging the Social, conducted at the Danish National School of Performing Arts. This project raises the questions, 
um, how can theater be necessary for people around the corner and still work with topics of bit bigger importance and uh, how to combine an experimental approach and daily life relevance. This project started with a focus on questions of aesthetics and participation, but throughout its development has gained sort of a, a, a new uh, focus uh, on the role of the circumstances for creating a social space and the role of artistic activity, activities in this regard. And Andres will report on this uh, in his presentation today. And as a final uh, presenter, we have uh, Karina Ranlo, uh, who is a film director, producer, and visual artist. Anu is educated from the National Film School of Denmark, uh, animation director in 2012. Before this, she had a, a, a developed a practice as a visual artist. She's an accomplished visual artist and film and video director. Her recent film works include uh, a family business, it Familie Fortane, from 2017, and uh, Die in Danish, The Unattainable from 2016. There was a remarkable portrait about the Danish artist uh, Knud Pedersen. Uh, in her visual artist, she integrates sort of film and anim in, uh, animation. Her artistic practice unfolds at the intersection of visual art and film production. Uh, and this position of being in between visual arts and film allows for a particular sensitivity to the context for production. And this is the theme for her, for her artistic research project that she's conducting at the National Film School of Denmark. And it's called uh, A Film With No Camera Movements Whatsoever is Trying to Communicate with a Wider Audience Who Wants to Play. Um, and this will be the uh, subject for her presentation uh, today. Uh, her project is an exploration of the format of film. It's an investigation into the ecosystem that surrounds the production and consumption of film and how that sort of feeds into a, a visual language, or opens for questions of how to establish a visual language. And part of her research is based on conversations with representatives from the uh, funding for films, the film critics, and the film uh, broadcasters. So I'm really looking forward to these three presentations. As you hear, they're sort of quite different in uh, uh, substance, but I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. So Emil, will you take the stage? When I studied in Finland at the Sibelius Academy uh, rather many years ago already, uh, I encountered something called Schenkerian analysis, uh, which was for me a very intriguing kind of intellectual endeavor and uh, a kind of theory of music which was very different from uh, what I had been taught previously. And I had uh, an intuition that there would be some kind of great depth to explore in this uh, field and in this kind of uh, esoteric theory, which uh, it, it is compared to uh, the more traditional music theory that we are taught in the conservatories in Denmark, for example. Um, then, um, around three years ago, when it uh, for the first time was possible for part-time teachers at the Royal Danish Academy of Music to apply for funding for artistic research projects, I thought that perhaps now is the time to develop this idea further. So I spoke with a, a colleague, uh, Thomas Solak, who is my partner in the project now, if he also uh, would be interested to play around with Schenkerian uh, analysis. And uh, it turned out that he also had uh, heard a little bit about it and was uh, equally intrigued about uh, the, the possibilities. So um, we first applied for a little bit of funding from our own school and uh, we got some money to uh, develop the project and uh, at first uh, our project was called Klingene Theory, so Sounding Music Theory. Uh, and the, the basic idea was that we wanted to find out how to use uh, theoretical studies in the practice. And uh, that made, to you may sound like a uh, well, woof, that doesn't sound like a project at all or something like that, but actually for us performing artists, it's not a given uh, necessity that we do use theory in the practice. Many uh, musicians are actually uh, against uh, having too much of a sort of uh, discursive uh, reflection surrounding their practice. They, some might even fear that it takes away some aspects of creativity and so forth. So, um, uh, we thought it was interesting to figure out how can we use theoretical studies, in particular the Schenkerian theory, uh, in 
uh, performing classical music. So then uh, we came to the year 2020, with, which was uh, the big 250 anniversary of Ludwig van Beethoven, perhaps the greatest composer of all times. And uh, I was busy performing Beethoven's music all over uh, Europe and until uh, the mid-spring, as you know, uh, <laughs> things came to an end in, in many respects. Um, but in any case, we decided to uh, focus on Beethoven because we thought that uh, he's the most uh, canonical uh, composer of all. So if we are going to develop something innovative, it would be very impactful to focus on, on his compositions. Uh, so here you see the two um, main ideas that we are bringing together in the project. It's, it's a, uh, innovative, perhaps even radically innovative reinterpretations of Beethoven's late piano sonatas. And then we are going to base those interpretations on uh, Schenker's theories. Uh, so now, of course, the 250 anniversary of Beethoven has passed a couple of years ago. But uh, luckily, this, the pieces that I'm playing, actually, we can celebrate 200 years anniversary next year. So the, that's perfect. The, the CD recordings that I will eventually make of the late sonatas of Beethoven, they will coincide with the 200 years anniversary of the, their composition. So as we started developing the project ideas, uh, we became more and more sure that we wanted to do something rather radical and innovative. Um, and I will explain a little bit about our reflections uh, uh, in that area. So it's actually, now that we, I told you the original title of the project was Klingene Theorie. We changed the title to Beethoven Reconstructed. And of course the reason that we are reconstructing Beethoven is because we have first deconstructed him. And... Uh, <laughs> That's actually what has been our main focus in, in uh, developing the project. It's to think about uh, what is it that we do as classical performers when we play other composers' uh, music. So just to explain briefly the kind of situation from a very general level. So in, in the classical music uh, community, there are composers who compose scores we call them works. The philosophers disagree about this, the ontological status of works. Do they exist and in what sense do they exist? Um, in any case, uh, we talk about performing works all the time. Uh, so, but when I play music by Beethoven, if I would sit down here at the Steinway, uh, which is not here, and uh, play some music, I think it's not really clear how much is Beethoven and, and how much is Emil Gröstein. So the thing is that in um, uh, composing scores, the, the scores, they greatly underdetermine their performance. So I can illustrate it in this way that uh, the score for a sonata by Beethoven, I mean the music score, it can be contained in a PDF file which usually is around two megabytes, 30 pages, something like that. Then a, a performance uh, sound recording in high resolution, it's maybe two gigabytes, so a thousand times the amount of data. Uh, and yet, uh, when we go to hear classical concerts, we think we hear Beethoven, we don't think we hear uh, uh, primarily the performer. Um, so that means that, that actually there's a really great uh, room of uh, artistic interpretation, as we call it. The, the word interpretation, of course, is very loaded and we're trying to think about whether we should also uh, invent something new, or at least uh, also try to deconstruct that uh, concept. Um, so, uh, the, the, the funny thing is that when we play Beethoven, uh, we all seem to agree to play it more or less in the same way. Actually, just to tell like a <laughs> very practical issue that relates to this is when, when uh, I or my colleagues publish videos on Facebook or YouTube, of performances of uh, other of composers' works, very frequently the videos are blocked by the algorithms or the robots of Facebook or YouTube because they, th they think that, that it's not an original performance. They think that it's, I'm using a recording of some other pianist. And that's because we all play so uh, similarly 
there's, no, there's hardly any difference between me and a thousand other pianists. And, 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 and knowing how greatly the uh, works are underdetermined in the scores, I think that that's rather puzzling. So then we started to reflect about what, what are really the conceptual foundations of this enterprise of interpreting Beethoven's works. And here I have listed some of the uh, usual suspects, <laughs> the, thing that we used, uh, the things we used to ground our interpretations. So just briefly about the, the, the first one, the master-apprentice did didactic tradition. So um, we have a way of transferring knowledge which is of course very, very ancient. We teach music in the same way that they taught it in the Middle Ages still. Uh, and that means that we have, um, well, first of all, we have a very beautiful tradition that we learn to take care of, but we also transmit perhaps some of the negative uh, aspects of that tradition. So, of course, there are many uh, aspects of uh, power dynamics and uh, conservative ethics that are contained in such a practice. Um, so, the philosopher Stan Gottlovich has uh, spoken about the music community as a traditional uh, uh, craft guild, in Danish, Kunsthandwerks uh, Lau. Um, so, the, we sort of uh, function as a uh, uh, guardians of this tradition, and if uh, an artist doesn't adhere to the norms of our community, he is actually excluded. So, for example, uh, we can think about um, musicians like Ben Fabricius Pierre, the Danish pianist and film music composer who passed away a year ago. Uh, we don't consider him a classical pianist. And yet, if you take a few moments of his music, it sounds exactly like classical music. So, what's the difference? So, I, as a classical uh, performer, I will say that he's certainly not a classical musician. And it's because he's not worthy of being a part of this guild, because he doesn't perform uh, scores by composers in the correct way. So, of course, I cannot go into all the uh, details of uh, what the differences are. And so, um, Especially uh, my colleague Thomas and I, we, we were very worried about the last uh, point here, the ideal mainstream performance, which I put in scare quotes. It seems that many students at the music conservatories, they are mostly concerned with achieving some kind of average performance. Uh, so actually imitating other musicians and then just adding a little uh, dash of something individual. Uh, but this is hardly a very creative uh, way of going about uh, an artistic practice. And so many of you are uh, familiar with this uh, tradition of cultural theory uh, in the 20th century with the trajectory from the new criticism, the intentional fallacy, post-structuralists and many great thinkers. So here I just quoted the footnote from the famous article, The Intentional Fallacy, saying that actually if the meaning of a word changes after it has been written, uh, why not say that that's also interesting to work with that? It's actually not important if the author had that intention with the word. Uh, it, it may change meaning, and if that meaning is relevant to us, why not explore it? There is no ethical obligation to follow the intentions of the author. That was the main idea in that article. And then uh, if some of you have visited the opera, which is just around the corner here, uh, you have seen this fellow Leporello uh, and know that he has this little book where he keeps a record of all the lovers of Don Giovanni, Don Juan. Uh, so uh, I was uh, visiting uh, the opera when uh, I, th I thought it was very amusing that, of course, uh, since it was a reinterpretation of the opera, uh, Leporello, uh, he didn't have a little notebook, he had a, a MacBook, a computer with a, an archive of uh, uh, the lovers. But yet the orchestra performing, uh, they were performing on uh, original 18th century instruments uh, and uh, tuned according to just the right kind of uh, tuning. And uh, you could hear that this was a very, uh, against the scare quote, uh, authentic uh, 18th century performance of Mozart's music. And then what was going on on the stage was uh, something like uh, 2010. So I just thought that that was a little bit of an absurd image. And, and so what's the explanation to this? And of course it's just that in the classical music community we are really still grounded in the 19th century way of thinking. Which is, uh, there are many beautiful things about being in the 19th century, uh, but also some bad things. And actually, my point is just uh, 
that uh, just what I wrote in the bottom here, that certainly there's an artistic potential in exploring uh, new territory and new ideas. It's not saying that uh, the ways that you, we usually play Beethoven uh, are wrong. It's just that we're all try to, trying to do the same thing. So let's try to be a little bit more creative. Okay. So uh, I think I used up the time already, you know? Um, so the Schenkerian analysis, just to briefly introduce, uh, it's a kind of theory which uh, sees the structural um, levels in a piece um, in a very inspirational way uh, for, for me in that uh, we see the, the voice leading structure uh, in the piece um, very clearly, unlike any other theoretical method. So as a performer, I really get a sense of how the, each moment relates to the whole of a musical piece. Um, the Schenkerian theory has all these te uh, techniques of uh, melodic prolongation that, um, well, it's uh, Schenker's claim that the composers had an intuition uh, about these uh, principles. They didn't think about it in any kind of aware sense, but they felt uh, instinctively how to put together their masterpieces so that they actually complied with these uh, principles. And uh, Schenker developed the special graphic notation to illustrate his anal analyses, uh, which you can see it's just a very primitive example here. And um, now I can't play this for you, but uh, those that can read music, they can see that this is the theme from Beethoven's uh, Ninth Symphony, Last Movement, the Ode to Joy. And so what Schenker is showing here, that there's a, a little motif the descent from the third down to the root, which operates on various structural levels. Actually, it's both in the very foreground in the melody uh, and also on the uh, phrase level, what is called the upper middle ground, uh, in the deeper middle ground. And in fact, it's also uh, the ursatz, the fundamental structure of the whole movement. So um, this is um, inspired by the organicism of uh, uh, Goethe, uh, who was one of the great uh, influences on Schenker. So Goethe thought that there was this thing called Urpflanze, the, the, um, uh, the Urplant, uh, which um, evolved into everything that we see in nature. So it's a sort of proto-Darwinistic uh, philosophy. And uh, Schenker saw this in the works of the great composers, that there was a, like a little, like a seed that could uh, become um, uh, a bigger motif, and this, this motif could be expanded eventually to become a whole music composition, uh, such as the incredibly complicated uh, masterpieces by Beethoven, which uh, for Schenker were, were the greatest examples of music of all times. So Schenker believed that uh, all masterpieces, they were an elaboration of this fundamental structure here on the right, you can see uh, the most basic version of that. So the descent, at, uh, at, as descending scale, that eventually resolves into the root of the harmony. Um, it's a sort of, um, uh, you could also see it in a, in a Deleuzean uh, perspective, that it's an unfolding of uh, the same kind of material that actually the, this, this uh, scale that you see here, uh, it's, it contains the material that you can build a whole symphony from that if you just uh, find out where are the cracks and the potentials for unfolding. So um, in, in a sense, it goes w very well with these sort of creative uh, materialist uh, philosophies that many artistic researchers are very fascinated by. So uh, we actually just starting to work on the project now from 1st of S uh, September. Uh, and uh, that's why mainly I've been concerned with all the context of our project. And right now I'm just reading the projects that of other uh, musicians. Uh, and we have, haven't actually started playing Beethoven yet, uh, just touching Schenker a little bit, but mainly I've been concerned with learning about uh, what other people are doing that is relevant to this. So here I have just listed uh, some of the methodologies that we are interested in exploring in the future. And uh, there are five different ones here, and they go from uh, the most uh, basic, crude, sort of conceptual 
structuralist analysis and then to the more esoteric uh, and uh, finally perhaps a sort of Deleuzean ontology where you explode all the concepts and everything is up in the air. And of course, since uh, music is an art form that uh, unfolds in time, if we can redefine uh, our notion of time uh, to something else than it used to be, then, I mean, we don't even know what the possibilities are. So, <laughs> uh, so I'm uh, very uh, curious about those uh, more esoteric uh, kinds of uh, thinking that I mentioned here. But I think we'll start from the more basic things and, and see that just... Uh, uh, we need to express the structure of the music uh, uh, in our performance and uh, so that could be a sort of first step to see uh, n now that we know what the structure of the music is, of course it affects how I play it intuitively. Um, but then uh, it might not be the most uh, interesting uh, way, so surely we will explore other uh, methodologies. The output of uh, my project will be a CD recording of the last five sonatas, so uh, hopefully it will coincide, as I said, with the 200th anniversary of these compositions. Then there will be a series of lecture recitals at the Royal Danish Academy of Music, where Thomas uh, will do the talking and I will do the playing. <laughs> uh, we'll also write a few articles and make workshops for the students at our school, and we will hold a seminar on Schenkerian analysis at the Royal Danish Academy of Music. Uh, so, uh, one of the uh, ambitions with the project is that we'll try to spark an interest in Schenkerian theory in Denmark, because it's fairly unknown here. So, um, I guess there will, maybe there will be some questions later, but uh, now we need to hear the next project. <laughs>